Perfect. And we're live. Welcome, everybody, to episode seven of MesaCast. Thank you all for joining. We're here again with Enrico Udo and joined a second time by Benny Hartman. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Thanks for inviting me. Psyched to chat with all of you. And today's topic is about identifying weaknesses in your own climbing. And even leading up to this, we usually have a bit of a chat before we go live. And um, I think the topic is super complicated. And so I'm really excited to kind of get down into it. But first off, I want to share a video. And this is from Udo's Instagram. And he posted it yesterday, kind of gearing up for this conversation. And uh, I'm curious why you picked uh, this video. So Udo, I'm going to play it. And then if you could kind of provide some context for us. Yeah, Pisa, maybe you turn the sound down a little bit. Uh, gotcha. Uh, yeah, OK, thanks. Uh, yes, these are three moments uh, where I was a German coach at the time, where I really thought we have to up our game. You know, that uh, there are certain really basic skills uh, that we are lacking to be more successful at these uh, competitions. And there were all these, uh, these Japanese climbers. You know? So this is in, in 2012, what I'm seeing right now, Reisa Sakamoto. And if it looks really basic right now, you know, like even the volumes, uh, I don't know whether it's Voltomic or some, some, uh, some of the first generation volume or second generation um, mm -hmm. volumes. And they're really, they, don't look very sophisticated with nowadays eyes, but uh, this, um, the way Ray move, you know, it's, there's very little pulling action. You know, very, uh, mostly the um, center of gravity is already in place when he moves, you know, even for, for where he's going to. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's really smart climbing that we hadn't uh, seen before. Uh, I, I think this, this problem got a second top by Ruslan Gelbanov who was climbing a lot more traditionally. And mm. uh, all the others just look terrible on this problem. Uh, and uh, I, I really thought, oh, we, we have to be able to climb like this to be somehow successful in these boulder <laughs> events. And um, this is really, I, I think, a part of coaching that you kind of have to look into the crystal ball and uh, also see where the... Um, uh, spot is going to you know where he's uh, how he's involving and if you see something like this and don't try to react uh, with your athletes i think that it will be difficult to be uh, competitive uh, in the long run and the same or like almost even worse uh, with uh, tomorrow in 2016 in um, munich because the munich world cup is um uh, the, uh, was the last one in the last World Cup in the season, but there was still the World Championships one month later, and was almost like, okay, if this is what uh, can be said now, you know, we we are not even competitive. We had a, a guy in the finals uh, in 2016, and he like everybody who tries to pull on things as part of his climbing uh, really was capable of doing this. The only other climber. Uh, um, they, they just they, who, who even could uh, get set up on this climb um, they trained this a lot and it was clearly visible and they have been very successful with, with training it a lot but I didn't see this underlying quality and this is why I picked these uh, three examples I, I, I saw at this time at the respective time I saw underlying quality that uh, yeah uh, you want to, or you you need to need at one point for a uh, for bouldering contest. So would you? And see I think it's always good advice to look for underlying qualities. You know, like look for principles, not look for mm -hmm. this uh, this one special case, but look for something that uh, is really remarkable. Even uh, uh, Tsukuru absolutely didn't win, and ne neither did Ray in these World Cups. You know, so they were not the, the most successful uh, competitors in this World Cup. But just uh, the way they did these problems really showed something new. I'm curious because you you mentioned uh, it's frozen here. Hello, you guys yeah. hear me okay? 
Mm-hmm. I'm curious because you you mentioned Benny in that clip and kind of asking him uh, basically what he thought of the three clips and uh, what his opinion was it. And Benny, did you get a chance to watch it before before you came in? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. And what were your yeah, thoughts it's on the these same? Clips? So for me, it was the same. Um, so especially it's Guru, of course. Um, he was the first male Japanese who stepped up and in 2011 in Kenmore he became the first Japanese to win a Boulder World Cup so and especially in that season he was just in a free state of mind and just yeah it just happened all these kind of things and in the later seasons then he started to think a little bit more and um, this is something maybe we can also talk about is it's not only about the, the physical uh, ability. It's also not only about the technical ability. Um, there are always different things, like also the mental side, because in uh, nowadays competition climbing, the, the performance level is getting, the, the margins between the different athletes are getting smaller and smaller, and it beca- it's becoming much more a men- mental game. Yeah. Um, but uh, I agree with Udo, also with the second video with Ray, um, if you watch the video, you can see the top, and the top hold is a is a question mark. I don't know if you <laughs> remember. There was a second boulder with a um, the other mark, but the the, the question mark I, at that time I was also the, there is no hole to 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 pull on, and um, maybe Udo, maybe you remember in the years before that, um, also the Dimitri Sharaputinov and Rustam, and sometimes they just. Also, the kind of new style bowlers, they still could sneak around by being just super strong. And uh, I, I know from Rustam at that time, at that time, we start also with different uh, grabbing techniques of volumes because before there was always a hold on the volume and you could, you know how to hold it. But with volumes, then it was something different. And uh, I know from Rustam that he, actually trained to get stronger nails because in uh, maybe Udo you remember there were some competitions where the people just grabbed the edge of the volumes with the nails and pull through because uh, the volumes in the beginning they always had small cracks and were not made that precisely yeah. so he even trained his nails to become stronger but this is Stefan the point. Danka by the way too was notorious really? for that yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah, but this is the thing do you do you um do you just you approach a new scenario, yeah? And do you uh, just how to say go into the war with the old weapons, or the new scenario requires new kind of weapons? And um, yeah. this is exactly the point with this orange boulder with Ray, because there is no pulling, there is no finger strength which is important on that boulder. It's just about the uh, body tension and the positioning of the center of gravity, and. Um, and working with all the, the the limbs and keeping the tension, and this was kind of a special one, and um, yeah, so yeah, I, and even I worse, agree. like the the third one, uh, I should have known because uh, a group of Japanese climbers, among them Tomoa Narazaki, that nobody knew. Did you remember what he ended up uh, finishing at the Youth World Championships in 2015? Not, I don't, I don't but even the know. Thing if was, he, I yeah, think he but, was in the finals, yeah. but he, he was not on the podium for sure. Yeah. And, also, uh, in the, and, also in his first World Cup season, I think, I, I don't I remember think exactly, but World in the end, was, was not good uh, place number 30 something. It was in, already yeah. in 2015 then, or? Yeah, but the, the thing is with, for example, with Tomoa, um, it, it's when we talk about yeah, understanding in competition, competitions what is going on, and so just um, it's always about decision making and quick decisions. And this is something Tomo is just super strong, and you can see it in this boulder, you know. And um, this was something also when I first saw him in the youth. I remember that he was always like oh, hold and jump to it. Okay, but. Sometimes it made sense, sometimes not. So he made a lot of mistakes. And um, so he was a very, uh, I would say, intuitive climber. So just by his feelings. 
And uh, so later on, he had to, to understand and learn to have a more uh, planned approach. Um, but still, he has this kind of uh, talent for super quick decisions. And there are some videos, for example, from the Adidas Rockstar Super Finals. Sometimes you can see him initiate the move, that is flow, stop, and then feeling, oh, this situation or position is something different than he expected, but he can decide super quickly and okay. And he always kind of falls forward or upwards and not downwards. And this is something which you can see in, the, in this video when he's doing the move on the slab, which you usually, in, in, the, in the past slab were always kind of slow. Yeah? But nowadays you can also have these kind of fast slabs where you can have super fast and um, precise um, uh, like uh, impulse of, of force, like pam pam, you know? And he's super good with this. And also when he feels, okay, this is not correct position, bam, next one and kind of correct the body position, but super quick and super precise. Yeah, and I think this yeah. was kind of, uh, yeah, step up. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. So I, uh, I think one of the things to, to kind of take away from this is uh, how important the context is in terms of identifying weaknesses, because kind of like what you were saying, Udo, the context had, had changed in a lot of ways, right? Like initially, if the setting changes, then the game has essentially changed. And so it doesn't matter what you're, if you're identifying weaknesses for something that, that you're not getting tested on, then it's, it's not necessarily gonna be something that's gonna benefit your climbing. Um, and so this is, I think right now, you, the conversation is between four coaches that's primarily spend their time coaching competition climbers. And so a lot of this is gonna be in the context of competition climbing, but the context like Enrico is mentioning earlier might be like outdoor climbing and projecting a route or projecting a boulder right uh yeah 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 but and in general we were mentioning with uh, benny that you know there's no huge difference between competition climbing and rock climbing or let's say just climbing indoor climbing too it's just you know about you know defining which here which are your goals and, you know, and I think very important how to try to self-correct yourself first and kind of manage yourself first. And of course, if possible being, uh, you know, supported by coaches or partner, because in the end in climbing, you know, it's very important why Tomo is so good in adapting because of course he's so good in self-correcting himself and understanding. So he has first a very good understanding and then of course he's supported by coaches and analysis. So, and I think as we were mentioning, the process is very similar because in the end, the contents are just movements. How I can get better or in some movements, you know what I mean? So, and yeah. a climbing movement is a climbing movement. In a comp, there's a little bit more stress, but outside can be stressful too because you have the last try of the day or the last day of the trip, or tomorrow, gonna, tomorrow is gonna start raining for three weeks. So, bye bye project. And so, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Talk, talk, talking about this process, uh, Benny. Like mm -hmm. uh, thinking of 10 years back, I remember, uh, I don't think that Tsukuro was on the podium in 2010 in Vienna, but a Japanese girl was. But uh, then 10 years back, uh, the, all the Japanese women struggled a little bit with anything uh, dynamic. So, yes. Uh, yeah. how, think... how did you go about that? How, <laughs> how did we get <laughs> where we are now? I, with, uh, I... With, with the dynamic things for the women. So there is in particular one boulder, which I remember quite well is from Sheffield. I think it was also 2010 or 2009. So there was one boulder and a kind of corner place where you had to jump from one wall to the next one and there were no handholds. So you just landed on some huge footholds. It sounds like, okay, basic, but that was the first time we were like, but there is no handhold. 
what happens, you know? So you have to jump and find a new balance position. This nowadays is pure basic kind of, okay, run and jump or something like that. But that was kind of new, new style. And of course with the jumping, um, there were other climbers who, which were better than, than uh, the, the climbers from our team. So I remember Anna Stör, of course, and Julie Wurm, which was from your team, Udo. <laughs> so I made also some videos with overlay and like, um, how to say, marking the trajectories just to see um, and to understand better the, the um, kind of movement and the, the biomechanics and how they use their body. Because for example, especially Julie, she was almost one one head smaller than Akio, but they jumped almost the same, yeah, the same boulders. Or and um, it was just understanding these kind of new moves. It's exactly the same like today. Today you have more influence from this kind of parkour style moves, but we're doing. It's always a challenge. Just understand what is what what is the basic. What is the the reason behind why these moves work on and how the athletes with uh, different biomechanics and different bodies can adapt in the best way possible to this kind of style. So what did your hands on, what did you do? You went frame to frame and you, knew, you drew the uh, something in or you, uh, you yes. drew it into that, the freeze frames yeah. or? Yeah. Oh, I, at that time, I don't know. I think available Kinovea, maybe you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was a, a kind of Windows app where you can put a kind of tracker on the body. And yeah. then at that time, <laughs> the, the software did not work that well. So you always have to correct it bit by bit. Manually it, tracking, but, yeah. tracking is much more easy. So yeah. today it's with like a, a huddle technique or huddle technique. I don't know how you pronounce it. For example, yeah. there is much more easy to overlay the videos. But at that time, yeah. it was kind of video by video with Pinovea and then later overlap it and see the yeah. different. Or you could, at that time, you could also export the trajectories and then kind of uh, overlay the trajectories. Yeah. And then how did you go with, uh, about it with your athletes after you thought you had a better understanding? How did you yeah, get it across? Yeah. Yeah, you, just you showed them watch and the video, of course, and discuss it and try to understand what, what, how it works and how we should approach maybe the next time to have a better result. But the, yeah. this is maybe something from the, the process which uh, um, Al said. So usually for me, it's always when you want to identify something or let's let's put it that way, if you want to become better. Yeah, there is always a kind of uh, three step process. So the first step is always, where am I? So in that case, where am I compared to the other climbers? Where am I compared to the scenario? The next one is where I want to be. Uh, what, what is my goal? What, what, what is the situation or scenario which I want to uh, reach? And then you make a plan how to get there. And then when we later talk about uh, performance analysis, this is with what you need in the first step, just to understand where you are. But also later on, when you have your plan and you train for it, you kind of regular test again, just to see if you're still on track. Because you can have the best training plan, but if it does not work for your genetics or for your body, it, it can be that you train and you will not have the, the result which you want to have. So it's always, yeah, and it's, it's kind of three steps. and. And then the fourth step is just the, the control and uh, correct correcting step. Yeah. And like time-wise, when was the first time that you were happy with how things are developing? Like uh, it's not, not just an accidentally success, but uh, like when, when you thought, okay, we're really making some progress in, in this. So when it comes to, to, to dinos, for example, dinos, with, with, the, with, the, with the women, yeah. with the women. Yeah, for, yeah. I mean, I remember, for ex as, if I remember right, 2014, in, by 2014, Akio could do pretty much all the dinos, but she needed an uh, awful lot of uh, attempts. It was really mm. impressive. She, her first attempt was not looking promising know, at yeah. all. And then uh, she, often she did it. 
uh, but it, uh, it was really the attempt, you know, and then yeah. we already, uh, so supposedly she was all, just to uh, know how long this For, for me, the, the to... kind of happy moment was in Hatsi uh, not World Championship, but the year or even the year before. In 2017. So was, I think, yeah, there was in the, in the, there was one dino, which Akio was the, the best on, on that dino, ah, kind of. the slap dino. This... The there was, dino? there was, there were that. I think that there were kind of two boulders. One boulder, that, because that was the season where they changed with, so they they uh, canceled the plus rule. So you had to finish in time. So there was one boulder which she yeah. kind of sprinted upwards and did. That was super cool. But there was also this dino to with a box where you have to to jump out. Yeah. Which she was uh, one of the only girls to do it, and she did it pretty fast. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was, I, I remember that. I thought, okay, now finally. Yeah. 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 I think yeah, but it, if I can highlight one thing uh, from your process a little bit and kind of, because it's where am I, where do I want to be and how do I get there, which I think is really, it's like a solution kind of, okay, here's the problem. We got to get to this point. And uh, one of the cool things about this is that probably you do this check frequently like you were saying maybe at some point you recheck oh where am i and am i heading in the trajectory of where i want to be because for for instance for me a lot of times or, or at the academy when we're coaching something maybe we don't know necessarily how to fix something like I, I i had a similar situation where it wasn't jumping but for whatever reason the the climbers in the gym from the team didn't want to climb they were very risk adverse and so they were really kind of scared on the wall and i could identify the problem but i didn't have a really good way of fixing it at the time and so it was similar like here's i i want to get to a point where we're not doing that as a team we are doing that like teams that are not doing that are performing better in this way and then for us it was through the setting kind of like trying to make the setting so it didn't reward that anymore and then it required a bit of checking and seeing like okay are we heading in that direction and so kind of going to your process a little bit and saying we're not jumping and then you got to a point in in Hachioji where like you had gotten there but how much of that checking throughout that time were you saying okay here we are heading in that direction Like wow. how do you how do you correct mm. along the way? Because I think that's the challenging part, right? I think this is a continuous process, because um, of course you in, in because climbing has no standardized moves, so it's always kind of new challenge, a new combination, and a new situation. And of course you you work on, but in the end, this kind of as a competition climber, the checkup is always at the World Cups or at the high level competitions, because then you can see my new skills. Can I can I apply them? in the competition, yes or no, yeah? And so for most of the competition climbers, each competition is a kind of checkup for this kind of overall checkup. <laughs> so, but of course, also in the um, kind of private development or as a rock climber, outside climber, you can check, do this kind of different checkups. You can do like a physical checkup on a fingerboard. You have your protocol, which you always do, and you know, okay, this I can, this I can't. Or um, there are always different ways. But the thing is always, um, so what, what are the, the points which are important for my scenario? And um, this is something, it's not only about the physical abilities. Um, because in, in uh, analyzing and understanding, we sometimes make the mistake that we want to have something standardized. We have to do something which we can reproduce just to that we have a test and then we do a retest and it always need to be the same test with the same exercise so that you can compare it. Then you can see progress. And usually we measure things which are easy to measure because then they are reliable. Of course, for example, finger power is easy to measure. Yeah. But, um, and because of that, many people, they focus on the easy to measure things. Yeah. And, um, but climbing is much more. So usually for, for me, I always make different kind of category. So it can be the physical. Right? So that means, of course, like the, the strength or the, um, yeah, endurance, power endurance, whatever. Yeah. 
or also the flexibility, for example, which is super important to have a um, uh, efficient climbing style. Then the second one is always uh, technical. So am I able to perform in all the different kind of uh, skills which are required at the World Cup or at the also outdoors, for example, it's the same. In this kind of area, there are some requirements, for example, for especially for finger strength or it's a super technical area where you need to be need to have a super precise foot technique. So the technical things. And the second, uh, third one is tactical. So can I um, see the different solutions? Uh, when do I change? How much time do I rest? Uh, when do I change my beta? Also outdoors. So how much time do I rest before my next attempt, for example? And or do I, do I how to say, climb the route again and try to find new beta? Or do I make a real attempt? Or it's always this kind of tactic game. And then the last one is usually uh, mental. So how do I perform under stress? Um, do, am I able to adapt to the boulder style, which is required just from the, for example, level of arousal? And um, body language for me is always important and mental control. So for example, earlier we talked a little bit about uh, competitions that sometimes we always watch the final boulder where it's decided who is the winner or not. But especially on the mental side, you have this uh, process until the point. So for example, never give up after the boulder, how you keep stay positive in your mind with your body language and so on. And um, yeah, and so it's for me, it's always physical, technical, tactical, mental, and then some, some other small things, but this is the package. And it always depends on the scenario, which is valued more or less, or which is more important on it. And this is also the then individual for the person, for the setting and so on. Yeah. May, may I talk about the mental side a little bit? Because mm -hmm. I think that uh, this is where it goes wrong for <laughs> actually every competitor except the winner, you know, like <laughs> in their mind. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's the biggest part of it. And now we, we talk about how do you find out now if something goes wrong, how you check up on your mental side. And one thing is like if you find there's a big difference between your training and your your performance, you know, obviously <laughs> it's the added nervousness that uh, keeps you from performing. And I know several successful competitors who really deliberately. Uh, try really hard to make their training really stressful. And one way they measure it by how nervous they are uh, uh, to perform, like even simple, uh, stupid uh, calisthenics, like just power exercises. But if you tell all your friends about it and you put yourself on the line and you even have a bet and you make it really, you make sure that everybody's watching you when you're doing this one stunt, you know, and you go to the even the campus board and your heart is like boom, 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 boom. This is what many people would find really annoying. But I, again, I know of several climbers who really try to have a tr intensity, a uh, mental intensity, in, even in the simplest exercises they do in training, just to check if they, uh, if they're up to it. You know, so that's just a, a little thing how you can, if you feel, if you very often in your training, you are as nervous as you are in competition, I think you. <laughs> of course, in, in, yeah. in the end, it's, it's about performing under stress and how you create yeah. this stress can be, you can do this in multiple ways. You can, yeah. for example, in, in the gym, you can limit your attempts. You can say, okay, for these boulders, for each boulder, one try or two tries, or you can say limited the time to just to to put yourself under stress yeah and or even uh, or, Benny, you told you... Me, mm -hmm. yeah. i don't know if you if you uh, still are doing this but a while ago you told me that you confronted your climbers with a boulder problem that ideally had a safe but hard uh, uh beta you know from what mm -hmm. you could uh, uh, see as uh, when you were setting it and the other one was risky but a little bit easier and you kind of put your climbers in, in this position and uh, to, to like let them explore for themselves also if they're drawn to one uh, uh, way of, of solving things. If they always play itself or they never play it safe. You know? It's also a good yeah. way for them to reflect on, on Did, their these are, You know, it, you, 
from the mental side, you always have to have a, an open mind because in the end, competition climbing is about problem solving. And the, the big difference from climbing to other sports is that we have, have not this kind of perfect or I, ideal state of mind. So just to compare it, for example, with other sports in, for example, in snooker, your ideal state of mind is, or in pool billiard, super smooth, low breathing frequency, low heart rate, high precision, yeah? but maximum power and all these kind of things are not that important, but you need to have this open mind, understand and everything. But for example, in MMA, it's pretty easy. You push yourself as much as possible. Your heart rate is super high, breathing frequency. Your focus will narrow like this. It's just about, okay, this is, I want to kill you. That's it. So punch as hard as you can. Precision, I don't know, one centimeter left or right does not matter that much. So these are the kind of, I would say the two extremes. I always call it the, the, the warrior. This is the one who is going into the fight and the, the how to say um, meditating monk yeah and in in between these two there are several things which, which can change heart rate breathing um, maximum power um, of course the focus and now the for me this is something which makes bouldering so so interesting because in bouldering it's about switching between the situations and be able to do this super fast and because mm. each style of bouldering requires a different kind of mental setting. Let's say a slab is more this kind of meditating monk. You don't need to be super explosive or anything, but you need to have good body balance and uh, high precision in the, in the movements and, and so on, low breathing and so on. And yeah. even the for focus example, this guy, that, you're, yeah. that you're aware and, and of, the, like the, spatial arrangements you can use. Yeah. And in the super powerful, crazy, triple jump, whatever, you need this, bam, this explosiveness. yeah. And the thing is, you never know what will come. So when you come out, you always need to start as a monk. Yeah. Because then you have this kind of open focus, understand yeah. the situation. And then if it's required, you need to learn how to push yourself super quickly into the right, to get into this uh, right mindset. But many athletes, especially younger ones, yeah. usually they they don't know how to to shift between the the positions and yeah i but, think this is something I unique in, in another bouldering. thing maybe we can talk well if one thing yeah. that i wanted to know I, about I, what i think the same okay go for it you can go Udo. okay yeah uh, uh, um, we, we all know climbers that uh, are on one side that they know a billion ways of cycling themselves up but they know none to calm themselves down mm -hmm. uh, and, and i think that's also applicable for rock climbing because if you worked on the on the project for a year you know you will be super nervous uh, starting and i know of very few red points that actually happened when the climber was expecting them so it's, it's super valuable to learn these skills. And I mm -hmm. mean, we were talking about how you address and analyze and assess if you're progressing in these skills. Just make sure that you have a couple of ways of calm yourself down, you know, or if you're more on the uh, flowy, dreamy side, then you need some tools to uh, <laughs> get you going. No mental. Yeah, but it's, and it's also a lot about... Breathing. It's, it's a lot about self-reflection because yes, you need to yes, yes, understand but... and you need to be able to see that at the moment I'm in this state or in, I'm in that state and be self-aware enough if you... then to react. Yeah. But, it, but it, you need, uh, you, uh, the, the point is you need to practice this as of you course. practice your physical training. Yeah. So if you, and also during these times, you know, it's really something like if you, if you know how to relax, you can make your heart rate drop by, by 10 beats. You know, like if you do your, your breathing right. Breathing. And, uh, and then it's just fun to explore a little bit because like in my case, what happens, I, I try to focus on my breathing and I try to relax and I, I can't fool myself. So I'm getting more excited and more nervous about it. 
And uh, so, uh, and this is just an interesting experience because if this happens when I'm lying in my <laughs> bed, you know, and I'm already getting nervous just by focusing on breath myself, how is this supposed to work when I'm in a, in a competition? So allocate some time to, to practice these uh, things, you know? One this thing what I mean. that I wanted to point out about the conversation that you guys just had is that I, I, I don't know if you guys would agree, but how much easier as a coach it is to work with an athlete that basically is mindful and is able to communicate how they're feeling with you. Because right now we're talking about maybe you feel this way. Okay, my heart rate is elevated and I'm having a hard time doing these precision tasks. But, you know it's much easier if the athlete's able to tell you, hey, before I got onto the slab boulder, my heart was racing and it made it really hard for me to focus. And so as an athlete, that's a really, really valuable skill to have the mindfulness of not just, oh, I fell off because my I was trying really hard in my fingers, but like scanning everything and being able to say, even if you don't know what happened, being able to communicate it to a coach or to yourself later on, like just noticing that you had a really elevated heart rate, that your focus was elsewhere, helps coaches solve the issues. Because even if like if the, the athlete is unwilling, and this has been the case in the past, where they're embarrassed about how they feel and they're not willing to communicate that with you, it's a lot harder to perceive those mental things as a coach. Uh, you can tell mm -hmm. a little bit from body language, but having that kind of mindfulness and communication is I think pretty important as well. Um, yeah, of course, uh, from the body language, you can, if you know the person and you can, you know, know him and then you see how he or she behaves on the stage, it sometimes it gives you a good clue. So what's going on? But of course, it's the, the communication is key. Yeah. So, and um, of course, then this is something you have to discuss afterwards. So, what were, what have the, about the feelings? How did you feel? Uh, this and that. And you have to address the mental side, of course, in the communication and discuss this point. A lot of times in the camps, we talked about it, like practice versus performance and kind of the different states. Because for a lot of people, I think maybe you've had similar athletes where they come after, you know, doing a round, they didn't do a boulder, they, they're able to get on it afterwards, and then they finish it. And they're like, Oh, the boulder was so easy, I was, I, I should have been able to do it. But even similar situations happen when you're climbing outdoors or trying a project. And even if you just turn the camera on to take a video of a try that you're exactly. going to, it can instantly influence, you know, how you're going to do it because it shifts it to this, Oh, this is the try, you know, like even the, especially if the, if the memory that you have isn't super, you know, like how much space you have. Um, yeah. But this is a lot about personality because it, it, really depends you know you have these uh, people which are always the best in the training and you have the ones which are super good in the in the competition setting um, because some people they can get this kind of 10 percent extra from the crowd and um, just with a second ray is an example like uh, there are several boulders from ray which he just how to say he gets lifted up by the crowd and keeps fighting and he really enjoys yeah. the situation he feeds he, he's this yeah. kind of show guy or you re, udo you remember uh clement betchan for example at yeah. that time yeah. he, he's kind yeah. of enjoying this kind of situations and can give 110 yeah. percent yeah then there are other climbers they which cannot do the boulder and later they flash it afterwards yeah but yeah. Or from the, I, I know other climbers, they, they climb the boulder in the competition and later you try it again and they cannot repeat it anymore. Yeah. So these are two settings, but this is about personality. And this is also, this kind of requires different strategies and different um, skills, how, how to approach that. Yeah, um, but it's it, it's still, uh, it shouldn't come across as if you, if you have a certain personality, you can't get it. No, I saw. Uh, no, I, of no, course. Oh, we know can. so many yeah. athletes, mm. and they all have slightly different ways. And some of them you don't find in any psychology textbook. You know, we, we mm. had such bizarre cases of motivation where you know usually they say you have to, if you want something, you have to have a like a vision of a positive outcome. 
but mm. I, uh, <laughs> they, they were mainly scared of like terrible negative things that were happening to, uh, that would be happening to them. But it, it came out nicely. I think the main thing is that you really, regardless what, if you want to be somehow climbing at your true potential, you have to enjoy your process of uh, mm. of this you know because it, it will be uh, full of revelations but it will be also really uh, <laughs> bitter sometimes this process and i think this is uh, regardless from what point if you're from the coaches you know it, with commun communicating with the athletes uh, it's a really deep uh, uh, process um but again everybody can and, do it you know and it's, yeah it's and, and this is also maybe something uh, or to do some experimenting too I think you have to be doing a lot of even uh, like mental experiments like you did with the setting. Uh, yeah, but also uh, this is something which is no matter if you're a pro climber or a kind of uh, yeah, le leisure climber. So it's never a linear process. I think this is yeah. quite important. It's not that I learn it and from now on I can repeat it all the time. And it's sometimes it's just a small detail which changes or and you fall back into your old patterns it's it's not a linear process it's always but it's it, because of that it's really important to have uh, good communication because yeah it's 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 tricky sometimes uh, this uh, is this interesting Udo and I talked about this l last weekend but kind of to what your point what you're saying I think it's important to zo be able to zoom out and take a bigger picture of your progression over time uh, one of the things that I would notice too is things like you're saying metrics that are quantitative are much easier to take you know so I could have an athlete that had qualitatively one of their best climbing sessions and an hour and a half of their best climbing session and then go to the hangboard for 30 seconds, try to hang on a, on a hold that, that they've hung before for a certain period of time and not be able to hold it. And then all of a sudden, like their session was just ruined because of it, you know, like their perspective on their whole session had just changed because of this other thing. So it, it's kind of interesting because it might be, I, I think those things are important. And it even goes back to the social media aspect that we talked about last time, where if you say, okay, here is, it's essentially trusting the process is here's where I am, here's where I want to go, and this is my plan. And th then you have to also learn a little bit of like, well, then I shouldn't care what this is. Don't let me distract this from the fact that like I'm on this plan and the plan is going to work. You know, I think that's, that's pretty important as well. Yeah. All right. So the other thing I what wanted to bring in quantitative uh, measures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I think the, the main thing that Udo is trying to get at here a little bit is that you have done quite a bit of both. And uh, right now we're talking about the qualitative side, but I even, uh, I have some pictures that I'll pull up in a second, but you also created the craftalizer and we got into it a little bit last time, but if you could kind mm -hmm. of ex explain what that is for us. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it, Actually, it started 2009 while I was still a student of sports equipment technology. So we had the project going on and I created a kind of campus rung where I can measure the, the force di distribution on the single fingers during the different grim positions. And I did some testing at the World Cup in Vienna at that time, which kind of got me interested in, the, in this kind of whole uh, field of testing. and. Um, yeah, and from there on, it, it started step by step. And of course, in the professional way, um, oh yeah, in the on a professional um, level, it's pretty common to have kind of performance tests. And um, so we created uh, some tests, which, for example, we also did one time with Udo with the German national team, and that test was about almost one hour. Yeah, and. Uh, at one point, I realized. Al, mm -hmm. you have, to, you have the picture. I yeah, I, I'll pull it up in a second. So we have the mm -hmm. picture right now. This one seems like a. I, I don't yeah, speak German, but these are all the no, things no, I, that you're I, measuring. I will, ex <laughs> I will explain in a minute. So that the thing was then um, on a professional level, you you 
you're used to this kind of testings and understanding. But for the leisure no, climbers, the, the uh, sorry, the picture of Euler. No, mm. I'll pull it up in a second. Okay. Keep going, okay. Benny. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and so so the thing with this with the leisure climbers is that at one point um, I realized that most of the leisure climbers they have no feeling for themselves no and uh, so it it came to me when i was climbing with some uh, athletes from the japanese team and some somebody approached me and asked me if he should how much additional weight he should use because now at the moment he can do four pull ups and um, he kind of reached the plateau and so on and i realized okay the he can fall, do four pull-ups and want to train with additional weight. This makes no sense. And at that uh, point, I realized that most of the people, they watch the training videos from the professional climbers and they think that, oh, because they are doing this, they are so strong. But this is not, but that's not true. This is the situation now. Like we um, talked about earlier. So you start at one point and then gradually progress until you reach this high level. And the whole idea with this performance test was to give the leisure climbers a, a base just to understand this is where I am now. Yeah. And um, and for example, you in, with the craftalizer, you com can compare to some different averages of climbers. So for example, the average 7A climber. And then you can see, okay, so how, how are my results compared to the average 7A climber? And for example, if I am compared to the average, super strong. So I have super strong fingers, super strong arms and so on. My maximum power is super good. My power endurance is super good, but still I am, uh, you know, I'm much stronger than the rest of the average. So that means you should work on your technique. <laughs> And uh, I had the, the, the thing that some people, they said, ah, my results in the test are so bad, but I, I can't climb that grade. Yeah? And they were pretty sad about it um, because of all the people always want high numbers. Yeah? But in the end, this is kind of good result because if you're weak compared to the others, but you can still climb the same grade, that means you probably you have a super nice technique. You're a very efficient climber. And in your case, you should work on the power side. Yeah. So it's like I mentioned earlier, it's always physical, technical, tactical, mental. And what, with a craftalizer, we measure the physical side, different forces. We measure kind of uh, some coordination tests, flexibility tests, and so on, some um, biometrics. And um, so you get a good overview about the, the physical side. Yeah. But then, Always keep in mind, you also have the technical side, you have the tactical and the mental side, which is a little bit harder to address. And usually it's super good to have a climber who is with good experience, who can give you advice, or you work with a coach, um, just to get this kind of know-how and uh, feedback, which is sometimes hard to, to understand by yourself and to analyze by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So, to what extent you would think that the uh, results just if you just look at the results of the craftalizer, to what extent are they determining the, the overall performance? How much do the so do, when, the, when we when we developed it, that was in two thousand. I, I think we start two thousand thirteen and fourteen. We had the, the first prototypes, and to to just to make this the test now lasts a little bit more than half an hour. And uh, in the beginning, we tested, uh, the original test was more than one hour, but we tested people who are um, yeah, professional climbers, climbing 9A, 9A+, plus, and some people who are just sitting at the desk, like graphic designer. <laughs> and just to see that the test results, so which kind of test had a good, uh, how to say, link to the performance. And then we kind of uh, shrinked it together to get this, uh, half an hour test, which is always the same. So it's um, comparable. So when you do the test and when you do the retest, the, the uh, resting times between the exercise and everything is, is kind of uh, uh, standardized. So you can um, you have, you have a good uh, comparison, good result. Yeah. So, and in the end it uh, relates pretty well. Yeah, for the physical side, 
but still, if you are super stressed, yeah, you can do well or not. And uh, from the technical side, the, the same. So, yeah, I, I know most of the people, they focus just on, on power. Like I need more finger power. I can I need to do more pull-ups. I need to do, add more weight. But the, the, the whole idea of this testing was just to get an obvious understanding of where I am now. So what is my real level at the moment? Yeah. And then adapt your training to that level. Because if you if you just copy the, the, the training from the pros, you will get overuse injuries and you will not get the, the progress which you which 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 is possible. Yeah. So uh, I think the the thing that you're mentioning there, because even last podcast, one interesting thing that you mentioned was that you have quite strong fingers, even in comparison to some of the Japanese team. But you're like, I'm, but I'm not a better climber than they are, and so yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a testament. And uh, one thing that I thought was is interesting about what you guys are saying is essentially like even if you don't know exactly what the weakness is, you you know the scenario that's causing you to fail. Like I'm not doing well in this scenario. If you can try your best to recreate that scenario without knowing exactly what it is and try to get the same feelings out of it, like I'm getting stressed. I mean, even if, if it's stress and you're having similar situations, like stressed out, we're getting ready for a test that's unrelated. Like those skills about getting ready for that test, test are probably going to help you similarly. And those kind of st strategies that you employ during that are going to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is this is more on the, the mental side. Stress is always stress can be different things, you know. But mm -hmm. for me, stress is always a, a um a good signal because stress means you're um approaching a situation where you have no solution at the moment because this creates stress. Yeah, so I don't know what to do now because I've never been in this situation before. This, this creates stress. But on the other hand, this means this is a situation where you have the chance to learn something new. So, and this kind of is a different mindset when you get stressed. So try to think about what is this kind of detail which makes me stressed at the moment? Because if I can identify it and if I can work on it, this will make me stronger in the end. Yeah, but sometimes it can be also the, the like you said with the tests, um, on the mental side, it can be the fear of failure. It can, uh, the, the fear of not um, uh, uh, match, uh, uh, reaching the, the own expectations if the own expectations are always too high. But this is, there, are, there can be so many different reasons for it. And um, yeah, like we said earlier, this is something about uh, communication with a coach, maybe with a sport psychologist, with your friends, whatever, you know. But yeah, this is on, on the mental side. Huh? And Enrico, would you say that even during, because this stress, I think, happens regardless, like, you, you know, certain people that avoid certain kind of climbs when they walk into a gym, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and yeah, I was just, just adding, I think uh, the, the mental aspect is the most important thing. And I think just to add uh, to Benny about the, the stress situation, I think a climber has to deal with the stress just because every time you climb, you are climbing on something new. Because we are not talking about gymnastic. We are not talking about specific movements. Every time we have a similar movement, but in a different scenario. And so I would say that I think the biggest step for a climber, the, the biggest takeover is just learn, not really learn how to deal with the stress, enjoy the stress because it's almost the coolest part in our sport, every time I can climb a new route, a new boulder problem. So shouldn't be a stress, should be just, oh, finally I can test myself on a new problem. So and change a lot your mindset and the mental aspect. Of course it's hard because you don't want to fail, but in the meantime, it's the, probably one of the coolest parts in, uh, in our sport. And of course, working on your weakness if you feel stress every time you show up at the gym and say mm -hmm. oh my gosh there's new boulder problem so i don't know how to climb on it i'm stressed i stay away i don't try them is 
is just something that you should work on because it should be the opposite. It should be kind of, oh, finally, there's a new problem. I can jump on. I can try to flash them. I can stress a little bit myself. And at this point, I think mentally, one, one of the coolest parts is in the game is you can try to train some, uh, uh, some skill you can easily test as a strength. Oh, this period, I'm very strong on fingers. I can see the result. This period, I'm very flexible because, oh, finally, I can do a split. And so just canalize all these good results in something that you can really test. It makes you more confident and say, oh, for sure, I can probably climb better. And now it's time to test everything mm. on this new problem. And so yeah, try but- to enjoy the, the kind of the mm. process. You know, yeah, but I I, it, uh, I I know this kind of situation which you're describing at the moment. So I think it's no matter if it's the, the in the gym or at the competition, it's a lot about self confidence. Yeah. If I have not enough self confidence, I will not jump on a new problem because if if I uh, how to say link my self worth, my self confidence with the outcome. For example, if I say I'm only a good climber if I can flash this, so. Should I risk it? Because I know with this style, I'm not good. And maybe all my friends are watching. So I will, and if I, if I fail and look stupid, so this will kind of damage my own image of myself in front of the others. So I, or if, if you are self-confident enough just to say, okay, just to be able to try um, your best, even if it has a risk of failure, um, this is something uh, yeah, you need to work on. And you need to understand that the competition result will not change your personality, will not change the, the worth of you as a person. You know, And uh, I think this is something that people usually link too much to results and outcomes and whatever, and link it too much to their uh, own self-worth and self-confidence. Yeah, I, I agree, especially because I think it's the same sometimes talking with our kids, our athletes, but in general, you know, it's, it's the same for, for me daily. It's just, you know, if you if you work hard and uh, if you explore all the aspects, then I think, uh, you know, climbing a boulder problem in every scenario or a route or do a test for school, just the same is that finally the way to take a look on your not only improvements at which point you are that day you know i can study mathematics for two years and then finally take a test and figure it out that i'm not very good in mathematics but it's a starting point and then from there i can keep studying and then take a look on the next test you know and, and I think it's more important the process in the end than the result, because in the end, the result is going to just put you somewhere in the scale, you know, or somewhere, mm-hmm. in, the re- somewhere in the ranking. But I'm with you that your, your self-confidence shouldn't change at all because you were training at the best, you were studying at your best, you were putting effort at your best, and you shouldn't have regrets if you were try to perform everything at the same time in the be- best way possible with the mental aspect too involved. Mm. Because- yeah, for example, I'm usually I'm not, uh, how to say, if, if I can see that somebody is trying 100% and trying his hardest he can, so there are no regrets. But if I can see somebody is not risking it and try to play it safe, then I kind of... Uh, how to say get a alert why why you know and then this can because this can be um as a so uh, a big obstacle to to uh, to get over sometimes and that's yeah. the reason why i really like what al was mentioning before because we talk a lot about that the difference between practicing and performing because you can practice just a very high level uh, kind of performance but just without being too focused on the result because sometimes we we put together too much the word performance and result because a good performance could be oh i just felt very high point on the route and 
but we are focused on the result, just clipping the chain or top the problem. Mm -hmm. It's very important to practice high performance because to perform an high performance, everything must work together at the same time, mental aspect too. And so you have to be able to deal with it, understanding, be conscious, self-conscious, and kind of understand what's going on without taking a look on the result. Oh, I was just falling mm. at the knee and destroying my shin on the on the volume. But if you were performing at your best, yeah. the best but this is can. yeah. But this is something we are talking now. Is when we look at the steps. This is step in my. Uh, I would uh, categorize it in step two. This is yeah. with the goal goal setting. Because you can set different kind of goals. You can set goal orient uh, goal oriented things uh, like um, and so for example the uh, goal oriented, the performance uh, yeah. oriented so outcome 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 over outcome it yeah. Yeah, exactly so that was the word I was searching for so uh, am I on the podium am I top ten and so on yeah but this is something I can. In, the, in competition climbing, I cannot influence that much all the time because it, it's my own performance, but also the performance of other people and so on. But you can also find some process goals. Yeah. So, for example, when I watched the competition afterwards, uh, if the athlete was able to perform on his highest level, just with the steps and warm-ups and what he's doing and blah, blah, blah behavior, and if that was good, this is a kind of uh, process goal and you have like physical, the, the performance goal, you can also set for yourself like uh, L already mentioned with some fingerboard exercise. So it, it can be always like the, the results, the outcome, you can, it can be some kind of performance or it can be the, the process. Process could also be, for example, the in on-site climbing, if somebody is able to do the quick decisions and so on, risk taking, da, da, da. So, um, yeah, it, it, there are always different kind of goals and it depends on what where your focus is or what kind of goals are uh, important for you. Of course. Mm. Awesome. We're, we're hitting the one hour mark here. Um, really appreciate talking to you guys. I think this is regardless of whether you're a competitive climber or not. Um, I, to me, one thing that I wrote down just for me as a person, because I think this is something that I could rem remind myself of, but even just in this conversation, I was like, oh man, we kind of came around to this thing. But to me, when I find that discomfort, when I feel that discomfort, it's like, oh, that's something that I want to work on. Like it, it, It's a good indication whether or not somebody's like watching me do something that if I ever hit that point, because of like what you said, Benny, it makes it, it, it's because I don't know what the solution is necessarily. And so it's a nice indication for me that there's something there that I want to kind of explore a little bit more. So just seeking that not even necessarily stress, but discomfort is valuable for me as a person. And uh, I appreciate kind of remembering that right now, but thank you guys. And uh, always a pleasure speaking to you. And I think in the future, maybe we'll t chat a little bit more about goal setting because that can have kind of a whole conversation on its own. And it mm -hmm. leads leads to this analysis a lot. And it was part of the process that you mentioned, but we didn't really get into it super deeply. Yeah. All right. Okay, okay. Thank thanks. Guys. Good to see you guys. Thanks, guys. Yes. Good yeah. to see you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Bye.